Hey, how are you? My name is Steve, uh, lead here at Connection, and we're so happy that you're hanging out with us for this time, whether it's your first time with us or whether you've been tracking with us every week since we started. Uh, it's been a super exciting number of months as we've launched Connection, and uh, Again, regardless whether this is your first week or not, we're excited to be leaning in with you. Hey, you're catching us as we're just finishing up a series called The Not So Fine Print. Um, just three weeks, uh, the start of April was, was Easter, and so to me, this has felt like a really short series, kind of. Uh, we're at the end already, but it's been good. The first week we talked about um, just looking at how we don't always want to keep a tight rein on our tongue. And maybe that's the, the words that we speak or the language that we use. And there's other, there's reasons why we don't always want to do that. We like control. We, we like our comfortability. Um, when we're around certain people, we know we could, well, it's, you know, we could talk that way or we could joke about these things. And really, Really, when you're a Jesus follower, it's uh, it's something that we should be maybe keeping a tighter rein on uh, than we have been. Week two, last week, we looked at remaining in Him, remaining in Jesus, and what that looks like. Um, as we as we often try to, we put our focus on production. Our culture says, hey, your worth, so much of your worth is based on what you produce or contribute to society, to your community. And while that's not completely a bad thing to have a focus on what we're doing, uh, it's, it's bad when we gain all our worth from it. And there's kind of a reset moment that we looked at where Jesus is saying, listen, you focus on, on remaining in me. Be in step with my spirit, if you're a Jesus follower, and, and I will produce things through you. So today, today we're going to actually take a few minutes to look at three things. A brief look at three things instead of just one. Because as I was prepping for the message, I, I just couldn't. I couldn't cross any of these out as uh, sort of during a brainstorming session praying about God what what do you want us to to wrap up with for this um, I just I couldn't cross any of these off so again the whole topic of of what we're looking at for a series it's just interesting that these things we sometimes overlook them because again we'd rather have control or our comfort um, or sometimes we just plain miss them because we don't take the time to dig into the details of our faith like we should. You know, we've dipped in just enough and and that's kind of like where we're good for now until, you know, we're old and retired and then we can, you know, spend a whole bunch more time reading our Bible or whatever the excuse is. Um, whatever the reason we don't or haven't implemented the things that we've looked at and we're going to look at, it's like we treat them like they were written in the fine print and we just and we just missed them. Like, oh, oh sorry, sorry, Jesus, I didn't, I didn't see that there. I didn't read that section or I missed that. The sucky part is the things we've covered and, and will today, they're not exactly in the fine print. This is, what's, this is what's unfortunate about it all. They're right there, clear as day. So as I mentioned, we're wrapping up the series, and, uh, and I, I'm excited. These, these three things, there's, um, there's some good, there's some bad, there's, there's maybe a mix of both, um, and maybe just depending on the week you've had, we'll see how they hit you. But before we jump in any further, let's pray. God, thank you for this time that we can connect uh, kind of together. Uh, God, we just, we're thank thankful for the technology that we have to take us through this time that is not what we want. The restrictions, I think probably for everybody, are a little more than what we would want uh, or a lot more than what we would want. But I just pray you would help Help us to keep uh, positive and to keep reflecting you in the midst of this time, in the midst of what's to come, um, because it's so important, no matter what we find ourselves in, for Jesus followers to be reflecting Jesus. 
So help us with that because it's really tough sometimes. Uh, And in this moment, may we be present. Whatever our week has been or whatever is coming, may we be present in this time. And may we uh, just still ourselves to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, so the phrase, sign me up, it's kind of like, it's a, it's a bought in thing. It's like, I, I'm ready to go. Like, sign me up. Let's go. Maybe you've signed up for a team before. Maybe you've um, signed on the dotted line for, uh, you've purchased a car, you've bought a house. When there's something major you're going to want to spend money or time on, we usually want to know all the details or, or most of them at least. Have you ever read all the fine print on something? Like maybe it's because you're really excited at the purchase and you just have to know everything about it. Maybe it's something you're concerned about. So you want to read all the fine print. Speaking of fine print, have you seen those drug commercials on TV? Uh, There's always beautiful music, nice scenery, people having fun. And it tells you all the benefits of, of this drug that they're trying to promote. And whether it's in the fine print or not, at the bottom of the screen that you could never read in time, they usually finish the commercial with this like, uh, like an auctioneer speed reading of like all the possible side effects. Aren't, if you, you've seen those commercials, they are, they're nothing short of alarming. Like, I'm not kidding, and you would know this, death is like, it's a common side effect of some of these drugs that are being promoted. Now, I mean, I mean, I guess if, if you know Jesus as, you know, the central part of your life and, and you're darn sure you're going to heaven, then I mean, I guess death isn't a super serious side effect, but I mean, it still kind of is. It's crazy the things that we can find in the fine print, how, how drastic they are, how, how impactful these things in the fine print may be. And so with major things, we, we don't want any surprises. We really don't. If you buy a house, if you buy a vehicle, you really don't want any surprises because you're sinking a lot of time or money into these things. So you don't really want any negative, let's say negative surprises. I mean, you buy a house and you find a suitcase of $3 million. I mean, that's, that's a probably pretty good surprise. And listen, while you can't know everything about say raising kids before you have them, you usually have some good conversations, right? Um, with who you're going to be having kids with to make sure you're both kind of ready, unless it caught you off guard or by surprise, but hopefully by now you know what causes children, right? So listen, in line with the details of what you're getting into or already a part of, because it's better late than never, on the topic of this faith that Jesus followers buy into, we're going to jump into, again, three things. Uh, do, you usually, do you like the good news first or the bad news first? I mean, I can't hear you. I can't even see hands or anything like that, but we're, we're going to go bad news first. And it's kind of bad, but it's, it's, it's good as well. Listen, here's the thing. Number one is this. We're called to suffer. This is great, eh? Like, are you glad that you carved out the time to, to be watching this right now? Listen, Jesus followers, we are called to suffer. If you've been a Jesus follower for any length of time, uh, you may already know this. Here's the problem. I think we forget. We forget that it's to be expected. Suffering happens in some form and we start to ask questions like, God, have you forgotten me? Or where are you, Lord? Or why am I being persecuted? To which I can't help but feel like God maybe sometimes looks over to Jesus with a, actually, like, why don't they read the book? I mean, I'm not trying to be rude because Man, sometimes I get that feeling. And, and when you see some people go through suffering like no one else, you can feel some of those things on their behalf. 
But I think at times we do, we feel shell-shocked into, well, wait a second, why, why isn't life all good? And I think part of that is, is kind of a grooming in the culture that we live in. For those of us here in Ontario, Canada, we live a reasonably protected life. And I know I'm painting with a broad brush uh, because we can experience all kinds of suffering here in Canada. But when it comes to things related to our faith, I mean, we have the freedom of worship. At least we still do right now. And so I think sometimes we're, we're a little shocked when suffering happens. Let me read this to you. This is from 2 Timothy in chapter 3, starting in verse 10. So this is from a guy named Paul to Timothy, someone he's kind of like mentoring. He says this, But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. In other words, he's saying, listen, you know me. You know me. You've seen what I'm about. He says, you know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. But the Lord rescued, it, rescued me from all of it. Yes, and everyone, he says, who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. This is not like, like if there's a brochure for being a Jesus follower, is this, is this the phrase you want to put on the front? I mean, I'm kind of like, I, I'm kind of sold yes and no on, on whether we should do that. I mean, yes, because then we're not hiding anything. We're, then we're not hiding anything. No, because I mean, that's not the be all and end all. It's not all about persecution. But listen, one of the worst things about suffering, about persecution, even when we're expecting it, is when we feel alone. That's why I love Paul saying to Timothy, listen, you know me. This is one of the reasons why it's so important for us to do life in community. So he says, you know me. You, you've seen how I live and you've seen what I've had to walk through. But, but one of the hardest things for us is having to do it when we feel alone. And our enemy wants us to feel like we're alone. Like no one in the world knows what we're going through. So you should just be quiet and just feel bad for yourself. And it's so hard when those we're doing life closest with don't get it. And this is a trap that we can fall into with Jesus because we didn't do life with him on earth like some of the disciples, like all the disciples did. I mean, they can reflect on the moments they had with him. We don't have that the same way. And so if we're not digging into scripture, if we're not having a full picture of who Jesus is, we can be duped into thinking that he's like some far off guy who's just kind of like this heavenly being who's never had anything difficult to go through. And in Hebrews, we get a little bit of a reality check with that. And this is in Hebrews 4. It says this, So then, since we have a great high priest, so it's talking about the fact that Jesus is our high priest, this is a bit of an odd term for a lot of us because we don't necessarily feel like we've ever had a priest or needed a priest. Um, but with how things used to be, people needed a priest to go on their behalf to God. And so Jesus is, is that high priest for us. So then since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, he's right there on the front lines. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Have you ever had to like um, ask for someone to go ask a favor for you? 
Like maybe you're just like, you're asking a friend to ask their parents something, or maybe you're asking um, like a classmate to ask the teacher something for you. And, and they don't get, they don't really get what you're asking or there's no passion in it. Man, if you've had to like rely on somebody to relay passion or importance of something, and you're not convinced that they get it, that's so hard. You're, you, you just kind of send them off and you're like, oh, oh this isn't going to go well. It's not going to get communicated how I want. And so this section of Hebrews is such an encouragement to us because it's saying, hey, Jesus, Jesus knows weakness. Jesus knows trials and testings. He had all that and he didn't sin. In other words, he is the ideal person for us to look up to because he modeled life perfectly. It continues, it says, so let us, because of this, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. It's because of Jesus, because of how he lived, we can enter in. We can enter into where God is. It says there we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Right? So like Jesus has become for us not only someone who understands suffering, but someone who, who pleads on our, on our behalf to God. He's whispering in God's ear other verses in scripture say, on our behalf. And he's someone who understands our pain and suffering. And in the midst of that, we can go to God and we can find mercy and grace. It's so important, so important that we also remember that that this suffering that Paul is talking about to Timothy is the kind that comes from living out your faith. This is not just like, you know, you sprained your wrist or something like that. And it, it, it's, it's a suffering that comes from persecution. It's, it's living out your faith. And I don't mean it's, it's only just people saying things to you because you've spoken out about your faith. It includes that. But what we often forget is the spiritual attack that's around us as well. And that's very much persecution and suffering that we can endure as well. But it, It's connected to us living out our faith. It's connected to you talking about it, making tough decisions that reflect your faith and not your comfort. We will get opposition from people and from our enemy who will do anything to get us off track, including having us suffer. We live in a broken world and scripture, scripture tells us we will suffer for our faith. So suffering is an expectation, but so is the understanding and grace of Jesus. Okay, number two, Jesus wants every area of our lives. Every area. This one is both good news and bad news. It's good because knowing everything about us, like Jesus still wants us all. Right? Have you thought about that at times? Have you just been like, man, I am one like mess of a person. Jesus knows all that. And he still wants all of you. He meets us where we're at, but doesn't want to leave us there. He wants to continually be refining us to be more like him. Because that's, that's where the greatest life is found. It's where the greatest impact is found. And it's one way we can honor him by submitting every area of our lives to him. Every area. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. It says this, He, speaking of Jesus, died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. No longer live for themselves. It's not a half and half. It's not a, he died for everyone so that they who receive his new life 
can integrate him and slot him in wherever they feel serves them best. It's not a half and half. It's not even an 80-20. It is a take one off the shelf and put the other one on there. It's, it's a full replacement. But we forget that. Or we don't, we don't want to remember that. Again, we treat it like the fine print. And we want to gloss over it. And it's interesting, Paul says here, who, who died and was raised for them, right? This is the end of that, that scripture verse we just read. Who died and was raised for them. Paul's kind of giving a bit of a resume as to why we should trust him with our lives. Like it wasn't enough that, that he died it's that he died and was raised to life for them. Almost like, almost like Paul is expecting some pushback on why we can't give up some areas. I mean, it's pretty hard. This, this area, I just want to let Jesus know. Um, I've been working on this for a little while, so I think it's probably better for me to hang on to it because I'm familiar with it. And I, I don't think he'll be able to, to tackle that. I mean, we would never, I don't think we would ever say that to him. But it's literally how we treat some areas of our lives, some, some struggles, some weaknesses, some habits. We, we treat them like, eh, it's probably better I hold on to them. Paul's like, you, you don't get it. He, this guy died for you and had the power to be raised to life again. Pretty sure he can handle whatever, whatever area of your life you think is important enough for you to hold on to or maybe too big for him to take. In Galatians, it says it essentially the same thing, but in a little bit of a different way. It says this, this is Galatians 2. My old self, my old self, the way I used to live, my old self has been crucified with Christ. So um, crucified, it's dead. Okay, it's been killed. There is no life left in it. This is, this is just kind of like what this first sentence is getting at. He continues, it is no longer I who live. I, I'm, I'm no longer living. It's Christ living in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I love the wording here. He says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ in me. And then he says, so I live. It almost sounds contradictory, but again, the writer here is saying like, listen, I'm painting a picture for you. My way of living is gone. My, my choices of how I just want to selfishly live my life is gone. It's gone. So he says, I live in this earthly body. He gives a tangible example of how we do this. I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God. I'm trusting him with every area or I'm supposed to be, right? It's holding with open hands every area of our lives. Some of you are holding on to things that you haven't yet given over to God. You've given him some of it, maybe, or maybe none of it. Because you don't think he can handle it or, or you want to be the one to handle it or you can't imagine life without it or you don't want to imagine life without it. Either way, you're still holding on to it because, and I, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. I know this because I've been, I've been there and I still struggle with this. We all still struggle with this. But when we hold on to areas of our lives, we're listening to the enemy more than we're listening to the Spirit. We're listening to what He has to say about it rather than what God has to say about it. You know, those, those thoughts of, oh, it's better that we hang on to it. Or, you don't need to give that up. I mean, these are all things that the enemy is whispering to us to help keep us in a posture of selfishness. And listen, while we're still holding on to that thing, we're unable to hold something else God would rather have us be holding on to. 
Don't be fooled. If we're holding on to something God doesn't want us to be holding on to, we're missing out on another opportunity he has for us or growth he wants to do within us. Holding nothing back, he fully gave himself for us. So why shouldn't we do the same for him? Okay, number three, love changes everything. Now we live in a culture that talks a lot about love, a lot, a lot, a lot about love. So this one in one sense is, is pretty much all good news. Um, it's not without its difficulties and it's not something that's unfamiliar to probably most of you that love changes everything, but I'm not, I'm not using it the same way our culture does. Let's jump into this is first Corinthians 13, a pretty popular chapter at weddings and, and just in general in the Christian walk. It says this, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Could you imagine that? Speaking, being able to speak every language on earth. I mean, that'd be pretty epic, but it's being related to a noisy gong. If I had the gift of prophecy, in other words, if I could speak of things to come, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I'd be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I'd have gained nothing. And how are you doing at loving others? Granted, it's a little tough um, in the midst of restrictions, but I think sometimes we can use that as an excuse. Maybe, maybe you've been forced into closer contact with people who you haven't really been thinking about, mm, how can I be creative, creatively loving my family during this time? Maybe you're thinking, what can I do in the garage that gets me away from my family? How are you doing at loving other people? Jesus seems to paint a, a pretty clear picture in scripture of how, just how important it is that we love other people. He had a chance to reduce all the laws of the Old Testament down to two. And he sends, essentially says, love God with all that you are and love others. He makes a change to it later, but he says, love others as I have loved you. And Jesus gave his life for us. How are you doing at loving other people? Here's the other, here's the other aspect of this. How are you doing at loving Jesus? Like actually loving him? Because I don't know about you, but this is kind of, it can kind of be a weird concept. I mean, if you were to name the top three people on this planet that you, that you love, and someone said, why do you love them? I mean, you would give, maybe you would recount experiences you've had with them or character traits. It's so different when it comes to Jesus in some ways, because we don't have memories of us with him that seem to be when we apply that to people that we love, those memories just seem to grow that love. There's, there's an inhale and an exhale with those memories of, oh yes, like, and it reignites that love almost in that moment for that person as you remember shared experiences. It's so different with Jesus. But it's so interesting because in the moments that we could say, okay, so how are we supposed to love him then? What is this love supposed to look like? There's a section in Matthew that speaks to this and it's very harsh. Jesus is, is not having one of his moments of, you know, tenderness of bring the children to sit on my knee. This very much seems like a blunt side of Jesus, but it's truth no less. This is Matthew 10. 
He says, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. Whoa, Jesus, actually, actually, I think what he's doing here is he's giving, giving us a very real example of, hey, like there's, there's the chance, there's the possibility, there's the probability, there's the opportunity for you to love me, not only like you love family, but more. And it's really, it's what we're called to do. And as great are the moments that, that we could reflect on that we've had with people that we would say we love, their actions, their actions can't compare to the kind of love that Jesus has shown for us. We just didn't see it firsthand. He's someone who can be with us all the time. He's within Jesus' followers through his spirit. He speaks to us. He's gone great lengths to show us just how great his love is for us. And not only all that he's done here for us on earth to give us a hope and a purpose like nothing else, but he's prepared eternity for us. And so maybe our greatest defense against why we don't love Jesus like we love the people we see is because we think, well, I'm not, I'm not with him the same. I can't see him. But, but should that stop us from pursuing him? Because we can know his presence. We can know his voice. Arguably, those are the two things we would say cement our relationship with the people that we do life with. When we can be in their presence and we can hear their voice. I love that Jesus gave a tangible, although seemingly harsh example of that our love for him could be like what we have for our family. <laughs> Maybe that's not setting the bar too high for you because maybe, maybe family, your relationship with family isn't good. You think, yeah, it's pretty easy to love Jesus more than I love my parents or my, or my, I don't have kids. So it's easy to, to love him more than that. But really he's underscoring that, that our love for him should be tangible. It should be something that impacts us, that's, that's moving to us. It's all about love. Too often we allow comparison and we allow production, our production, to dictate acceptance and worth. And worth maybe that we place in other people when we compare ourselves with them or, or we look at their production. There's no way around it. Love builds relationship with God, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and also with others. So as belief would lead us to hope, like John 3, 16, love leads us to purpose. It's as we lean into a love for Jesus and a love for other people that he reveals our purpose. Everything stems from our love for Jesus. Worship in, in music is empty if we don't have a love for Jesus. It doesn't ma matter how great you could sing, how on key you may be. Without a love for Jesus, it's empty. Love helps us with our language. It stems from our time spent with him as we remain in him walking in step with his spirit. It helps us in our suffering. And as we do what feels like the impossible and allow him to have his way in every area of our lives. If nothing, if nothing else, may we be praying this week that we would fall more in love with Jesus. So we would live this life in a way that reflects him keeping us in a posture that we can hear from him and be sensitive to the moving 
of his spirit within us. Not missing anything. Even the not so fine print. Let's pray. God, thanks for this time. Thank you for your word that we can look at that is, it's living, it's active, it's still teaching us today. I pray that you would help us to understand it. God, help us not to miss things that we would, you know, write off as being in the fine print. Give us a thirst for your word because it's one of the ways that we can have moments and experiences with you because it can speak to us. Your spirit shows us the truth, brings truth out of your word to us. And so I just pray that you help us with that this week. God, it's, it's so hard to suffer sometimes, regardless of the cause. But when we muster up the courage enough to speak out about our faith or make tough decisions and then and then we suffer for it. It can, it can be hard. But as, as we know that it's to be expected, may we also know that your grace and your mercy and your understanding can also be expected. God, I just pray that you would help us to give you every area of our lives, the things that we think are impossible, the things that we don't even want to talk about. You already know. Help us to give you every area of our life so that we can become even more the person you're calling us to be as we, as we look to reflect Jesus. And, and help us with our love, our love for other people that may be really tough right now with some. God, in our love for you, our love for Jesus, which yeah, sure, has its challenges as far as our human experiences of love are concerned. But let that not be something that stops us from leaning more into you. Thank you for this time. Thank you that you will walk with us uh, into what is to come in the coming days. And God, I just, I'm thankful for the people who, who may be listening and watching right now who don't yet know you. And I pray that God, I just pray that they would submit to you. They would, they would recognize that their own attempts at living this life are not, are not working. They, they want to be a part of a God who loves his people as much as we're describing here today. And so I pray this would be the moment, the life change moment for anyone who hasn't yet accepted Jesus. God, that you would you would come into their life, invade. May they never be the same as they seek to make you and keep you the center of their life as they believe you died, Jesus, for their sin and forever paid the price. Thank you again for this time and thanks for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, um, thank you so much. Thanks for um, just taking the time today to to be with us during this message. Uh, hopefully you're going into groups right now to, to further discuss this topic and uh, these three things that we've just gone over. Uh, and thanks again to those of you who are, who are contributing to the church. Man, it's so exciting as we are, again, in the early stages of connection. And we're not only planning for things that are right around the corner, um, but we're planning for things that are a little further out as well. Um, and as, as restrictions ease, we're really excited to be leaning into how we're going to reach out into the community. And, and that takes resources. And so we're just, we're so thankful for those of you who are leaning in and maybe trusting God with your finances for the first time or in a way that you you haven't trusted him with it to the degree that you haven't, you've trusted him with it before. And so we just thank you so much for that. Hey, um, we're so thankful for our home group leaders as well. Man, if you aren't part of a home group and you're in the Windsor Essex area and you'd like to be, let us know. We'd love to get you plugged in. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon.